And so I'd like to put on record our thanks and vote to both of those for their service to the authority. Um, in terms of just clarity for new members, clearly because Guy has resigned and we have an obligation to have um, a clerk under our legal obligations to the authority, Dave Daycock, who was appointed uh, two or three years ago as the, as the Deputy Monitoring Officer, will be acting as an emergency substitute in that role until we make a substantive appointment of a, of a clerk. A clerk is the authority's appointment, it's not for the officers to appoint, and we will, we will now be looking for a replacement, and that will go through the Employment Committee and ultimately to the, to, to the, uh, to the Fire Authority for approval. So that will now, will now go in train. Okay, but in the meantime, we are fulfilling all our legal obligations by, by Dave Daycock, um, who is also the, the clerk to, to Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Service, so he has you know, 10 big <coughs> um, The other thing is that I thought it was important that we, we make the connection between us as a fire authority, how many people are actually do the work which is the Fire and Rescue Service, and there, there is one of our fire appliances along with crew on site, so if you've not the opportunity to visit them already, at the end of the meeting, please go do so. I mean, can you tell us where they are? Just sort of reception. Okay. We, we did, I, I don't know if any of you came to, some of you came to the, the meeting we had at the yeah, the induction meeting, and um, the local nursery had the greatest delight of their life, I think, in, in, in viewing with the fire authority members of the fire appliance. I don't think sadly there'd be anybody of that age there today, will there? Somewhere. So we, go, we now move on to uh, public access. Do we have any public access? No, no questions. Okay. okay. So now we're on to the minutes. So they've all, they've all been the papers that have circulated the members. So 
but we're going to get some nominations for, for chairs if we may, and indications to the clerk who wants to go on the committees. I'm sure there will be some vacancies which need to be done. So if, if, if principal groups can notify the clerk of who the group leader is, then, then he, he can liaise with them to get to get further nominations. Thank you, Chair. Shall I just uh, talk members through yep. the report very briefly? Uh, the first point to note there is that it's not actually for this final vote to appoint the chairs, it's for each committee itself to do that. But you can uh, make nominations if, if that is uh, yes. and that they want members. So I invite members to do that either possibly now or through the chair uh, later on. And then the second recommendation is to delegate uh, myself uh, to liaise with the political groups such as they are in order to identify who's on which particular committee itself. So again, that's part of the normal process. I think the chairs have uh, a number of uh, nominations, but until that is finished, we won't be able to finally decide who are on the respective uh, committees. Um, I also understand it's normal practice uh, within the Fire Authority for the representative of the local government association to be the chair, so again, we'll have to vote on that. I'm assuming that members will be uh, happy to vote on that. We need a representative on the Southwest Council, so again, uh, the chair may invite you to put forward names for that. I understand uh, point E, the representative of the Southwest Council's employer <coughs> uh, has already been identified, and that will be Councillor Phipps. Um, am I correct in that, Chair? Uh, and then finally, uh, we also need an employer representative on the local pension board. So those are the issues that we can hopefully uh, identify here today. But if you can't, we can sort that out down the line and fill uh, the, the relevant vacancies uh, in the first of time. Very briefly, the uh, report sets out the composition of the Fire Authority itself. It's my understanding you broadly put yourselves into four political groups. I think we've got a Conservative group, a Labour group, a Independent group, and a Green Store Independent group. And we will therefore seek to replicate that representation within the committees themselves. It's broadly on the basis of two, 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 and one as a uh, broad representation of the vehicle of the authority itself. But again, we can look at that down the line. And if there are changes to the political groups, that can be reflected in the composition of the committees themselves. Um, other than that, I think it's hopefully fairly straightforward. So if we can identify uh, any names, the chair uh, will do that in a minute. But otherwise, I would delegate about to sort this up with the group leaders down the line, and hopefully it will all be in place for the appropriate meetings to be convened in time. And they, as I've said, will also actually formally uh, elect the chairs of each individual committee. Well, I've had, I've had informal discussions with, with people prior to the meeting, um, and Previously, Claire Lake was, was chair of the Dice Committee, and I was going to ask her if she would continue in that role. Um, the AGC Committee is currently chaired by Paul Goggins, and he, he said he's happy to continue with that. Um, Tony Davis, who well, I think is in his now his last year of service with the Fire Authority, has, has led the, the Performance Review Committee for a considerable number of years, and I would ask Tony if he's happy to continue in that role. Um, and Chris, did you have any suggestions in terms of employment? Yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. Go down to that. Chris Windows then for employment. I was going to suggest uh, we have we have a session on the 12th of July to look at um, the train day, look to get the form of the constitution for the fire authority. Um, as part of that, I was going to ask if we would keep the General Purpose Committee in abeyance, because I think that's been a committee that's been deemed to be perhaps beyond its usefulness. So rather than appoint somebody as a chair of that committee and then say, actually, we're, we're going to scrap that out after, after we review the Constitution, um, if we have any emergency business necessary, I'd form an emergency meeting with the whole fire authority to, to consider those matters um, should any, anything arise which is unforeseen. So our, our members will be happy with the proposal.
is, is normally the chair of the fire authority. If, if anybody else would like to take it on, I'm not going to fight them off. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make a big, big admission. I've been to the fire, um, fire conference. Other than that, it's not a desperate yearning's job. If somebody else would like to take it on, um, I'm more than happy for them to uh, put their name forward. <laughs> I can put my name forward now, but if anybody wants to think about it and come back and say, I'd like to do that job, I'm more than happy to let them do it. So happy to you. Rick, you're happy to read me, and then if, I, if anybody wants to, to, to come on, I'm happy to um, put your aside. Okay. Southwest councils, we tend to only go when there are items of interest to the fire authority. We don't go to every meeting just to say that we're going to find it on it. And again, if anybody would like to put them in forward for that, um, I'm looking lots of hands going up. Anybody found the occasional trip out? Chris? Yeah. Okay, Chris Windows. Um, Celia Phipps was previously on the um, employer's panel. Like, again, she only attends as and when there's fire related business on there. We have not seen it to continue us on that role. I think. And the employee, employer representatives of the local pension board, that was previously Chris Jackson, who was no longer on the authority, who was a substitute. Now, I seem to recall that Chris Windows was the substitute. Is that correct or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, I was on there, yes. Yeah. So are you happy to continue with that role? I'm well, not sure the adjective is accurate, but I will continue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I, I, I remember the chair. What was that? Chris, Chris Window, the Council Windows is one. Um, Chris Jackson was the other, I think. Oh, oh, right, sorry, hold on. Sorry, I did you notice. You voted dis, 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 uh, me, Chair. I was mentioning, you're, you're not such a you're fully in the team. No, no, no. So, is, is there anybody else that would like to go on the local pension board as a representative of the fire authority? Uh, chair, I'm, I'm chair of the Avon Pension Fund, so uh, I'd be quite happy to, to do that. That sounds like you're an admirable choice. <laughs> uh, uh, perhaps not. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, where to go across, I don't know, sort okay. of thing, but obviously I've had a bit of experience on pensions. Lovely. So. That's, that, that sounds like you've qualified yourself for the job admin. Right, so, yeah, yeah, so we're all happy for Councillor Shin to take on that to the yes, right. yeah. That's good, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, colleagues. Do we need to appoint a substitute? <coughs> Any nomination for super sub, or should we just do that on an ad hoc basis? If, if, if both of these guys are definitely keen to go on, definitely <laughs> Is there, is there a training implication though, Martin, in terms of the... There, there is, it would be no, useful to substitute on which this does attend to make sure we're up to get to see how our attention for the training process. Do we have any questions for a substitute then for the pension board? Can I be a substitute? Thank you. Thank you. So, so that's Councillor Richard, you're happy about that, okay. okay. Um, the other point which I did raise at the training meeting on the 12th of June was whether moving forward we want to look at options to become non-politically grouped. And I'll just leave that idea on the table. We have a constitution meeting <coughs> that we to change. There are certain ways of doing it. I don't want to try and do it today, I think it's too complicated, but I think I'd like to consider that for the future as to how we become essentially a non-partisan organisation looking after our responsibilities for fire and safety. Um, are you happy that we, we continue to explore that part of the Constitution review? Thank you very much. There is in, in, in your pack um, a list of the dates of the various meetings. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask you to put those in your diary please and the training sessions giving them the new members that we have. I think it's very important that you can kind of attend those and attend for the bit of the quality of June. We're very busy time for all of us to put the to help out and uh, come together after the municipal year. Chairman, could I just say
that the effects of the fall of foreign music is unfortunate. They seem to that the, the cycle of ownership of Bristol teasing committee, so mm -hmm. I'll do my best to walk the potential. Obviously, if I can, if I can. Okay. Well, I think that's a very important point that Richard raised. I think please you look through the calendar. You know, three of the four authorities have had elections and new members on, so it's potentially the issue that we have to crop some clashing dates now. Um, there's a year's worth of dates here. If there are any dates you, you see as, as clashing, we can change them. These, are, these, are, these dates are set in stone, so as long as the statutory notice of change, we, we, we can make those amendments. So please. I think if, if, if it's passion with a main meeting within your authority, or even a very important committee meeting within your authority, please let the clerk know, or Emma know, and we can, and we can, re we can rearrange dates for you. Just one further for the chair. Um, obviously, I, but I'm sure my colleagues, welcome your re-election as chairman. <coughs> in this is to my cancer, Matsy, uh, as a relatively new man, Brian, I'm certain we are actually <coughs> in the right direction as an authority, of course. But I'm equally conscious you have now heavy burdens as leader of North Somerset. So, what one appreciates, I think we need to pay some succession planning, of course. But in the meantime, I think the committee chair need to up their game to support you even more strongly. You make a very valid point, Richard, and certainly from my own personal point of view, I think the continuity viewpoint, I'm very pleased that you've elected me end of the year, but I do think that this time next year, we ought to have something different doing this job. I think, I think from the point of view of the journey we're on, and the fact we need to be we need to be renewing where we are, regardless of the ethical obligations to the North Somerset, which clearly are, you know, are, are another, another issue for me personally to deal with. But from my understanding, we've got a lot of new members on here. We've overcome you know, many of the challenges we've had, but we, there are a lot more to come. And I do think it'd be very appropriate this time next year that I'm not sat in this seat. So please, 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 as members, think about who you, you, you would like to lead from, <coughs> from June 2020 onwards. I do think it's important. I think it's important as well for, for the service to know that there's the, 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 the changes. There's some the, the continuity because of, 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 of a smooth transition, and like we had a lot last time. I think it'd be really, really useful if people start thinking over the next 12 months they get used to the responsibility and duties within the authority to make that change. So thanks for raising that, Richard. I really appreciate that. I do think, yes, again, a lot of new people here, and, uh, and the committee structure does need to be strong with that and the criticism of the past, but the weakness of the committees. We have certainly improved that, and I'm sure there's more work to be done. I think part of the Constitution review, we do need to look at how we better use those committees to, to, do, to do the policy and scrutiny work and bring back to authority in a, in a, in a, in a very challenging way. Item 11, which is the forward plan. Thank you, Chair. Very briefly, uh, if members could uh, slightly change the title there. Uh, it's the report of the Deputy Clerk, and unfortunately, Mr. Goodwin is now left, and I'm stepping up temporarily to try and help out here with uh, that photo will be somewhere in the future. Um, <coughs> the, uh, what we're seeking to do in relation to this report is to actually build in the concept of a forward plan into the decision making processes of the fire authority itself. It's not a strict legal obligation as I stand in, uh, in England, but nevertheless all of your constituent authorities have forward planning uh, and it is a pretty good practice as well I think for uh, the fire authority. So, so really what uh, the office has done is to put together a <coughs> forward plan uh, schedule that is set up in appendix 11.1 uh, uh, for you there and that will give some structure and coherence if you like to the work of uh, the fire authority and hopefully uh, that will enable you to plan more effectively ahead as to the challenges that you may uh, be meeting. Uh, so really, uh, unless uh, either the chair or the chief fire officer wish to expand on any of those particular uh, points, uh, the recommendation is that you approve uh, the forward plan set out at appendix 11. I'm perfectly happy with the forward plan. 
that Mark assumed the last free date should be 2020, <laughs> otherwise the fun is going to the <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so we're, we're, we're just asking then, and then we're we happy to approve the plan. Mark. Right. We'll get a new calendar. <laughs> okay, so now we're on to item 12, which is the gastric charity. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. 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 Thank it's, uh, its birth, its creation came about with the then Chief Fire Officer David Hutchins back in 1991 went on holiday to Gambia and witnessed the road traffic condition where um, six members of one family died in that car accident. Um, he obviously, the reason or the core, one of the core reasons there was a failing of that road traffic condition was due to uh, equipment, procedures, training. Um, and uh, uh, an infrastructure within Gambia to respond, there wasn't one. Um, so uh, Dave brought back um, the, the, the ethos of actually supporting, setting up the charity, GAFSIP, and the ethos to actually provide um, support and linkage and collaboration between Aiden, as it was then Aiden Fire Brigade, now Aiden Fire Rescue Service, and the, and the authority, and the Gambian Fire Service itself. Um, in, 94, the public protection, in 1994, the Public Protection Committee of Avon County Council recognised it as a supporting charity, and in 2004, the, the organisation became a charitable trust. Over, those, over that period of time, um, I'm going to hand over to colleagues in the room in a minute to, to explore more for yourself and members. Over that period of time, a considerable number of officers and firefighters from, from the UK and from Avon Fire Rescue Service in the main have been out and done training uh, and a uh, 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 donation of equipment, adoption of equipment and training on that equipment to provide a, 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 a better uh, class of response over in Gambia. What they've brought back from that is um, it's been a two-way lesson process. Um, lessons delivered for, the, for Gambia and equipment delivered and training and development, <coughs> excuse me, but also that experience that our officers have had over uh, working in Gambia is actually assisting and boosting our uh, uh, levels of understanding back here um, and adopting some of those lessons back into our training back in uh, in Fire Rescue Service. So I'll pause there, hand over to my colleague Vaughan and to the colleagues from uh, GAFSIP charity itself. That's all right, Chair. Yeah. Uh, good morning, members. <coughs> As uh, the ACO has highlighted, Historically, the fire authority has disposed of some of its assets, not just appliances, but other assets like fire kit and redundant breathing apparatus sets. In the case of the breathing apparatus sets, by donating them to Gambia, that saved the authority £4,000 in scrappage costs of what it would have cost to decommission those breathing apparatus sets. And obviously, they've gone then to use in a developing country and has further enhanced the support that they can give to their communities. Um, the appliances and other equipment is shipped out uh, at no cost to the authority. There are no political implications due to the, the way the uh, charity is structured. And there are two recommendations, as I'm sure you're aware, before the committee today. Those recommendations being one, to consider whether to continue to adopt GAFSIP as a charity partner with the organisation. And then secondly, it's to consider whether to support the charitable donation of identified fire appliance assets for the year 2019. Before I explain the issue with the fire appliances, if I could just highlight some of the key achievements of GAPS, GAPSIP, which you've obviously got in your packs to date. We've seen an increase of, from 2 to 11 fire stations, obviously given a massive amount more coverage to the areas of Gambia. We've seen an increase in staffing levels from 87 to 1,341 staff, thereby bringing employment and making a more prosperous community. There's currently a new station being built, which will provide another 72 new jobs. Obviously, we've seen water rescue implemented, implemented in the Gambia, links with schools in the Aden Fire and Rescue Service area. Free health checks and health clinics take place on the fire stations, which have been supplemented by Aden Fire and Rescue Service donations. There's various links now across the country with ambulance service links, the Red Cross are involved, medics are being trained, French aid <coughs> hospital has been involved, 
you can see there's a massive amount of work that various women's support groups have been set up that simply weren't there prior to the involvement of Avon Fire and Rescue Service via GAFSEP. Moving on to the item 4.23, which details the Type B appliances. Basically, a Type B appliance would be an older version of the type of appliance we see outside today, basically your frontline fire engine. Uh, in the papers, there's an independent valuation which was gained in March 2018. That independent valuation was for a total of five appliances, the four listed and then the additional appliance listed which was currently, which was previously used as a training appliance at Bristol Airport. So the total value of those four appliances, or five appliances, sorry, in March 2018 was between zero and around about £14,000. The exact figure being, yeah, £14,000 is a maximum. We've received confirmation from an independent valuer that the value of those appliances drop on average by around about 10% per year. So the value to the, the authority currently taking in, into account a 15% reduction would be £11,900, assuming they all receive the full amount they would be anticipated to receive at auction. So the question really would be, would the authority be willing, or is the, is the authority still willing to take the option of gifting those appliances to Gambia and then further enhancing the fire cover within the Gambia area and obviously there are other issues if we sell them through auction will they be used for nefarious means afterwards potentially we think of the hen and stag parties uh, piling out of a fire appliance in the middle of Bristol or Bath or further afield wherever that may go it doesn't just portray a poor image of the fire service in Avon it's the fire service in general across the UK wherever those appliances are used. And obviously then the, there is the issue they may not achieve anything at auction, someone may not be interested in buying them. And obviously the value to Aden Fire Authority is un, just under £12,000, but the value to the Gambia and the community as a whole and the pu publicity and positive image that portrays of Aden Fire and Rescue Service far outweighs keeping them within and auctioning them um, through the normal means. So basically, the question, unless there are any questions around the paper that you were presented with, the question would be, are the, are the authorities still willing to continue with this arrangement and donate these appliances? And bearing in mind, with the current building taking place to a self-help scheme in Bajakunda, these appliances obviously would immediately be put to use when they arrive in Gap <coughs> within that new fire, apply, uh, fire, fire station setting. Chef, sure, just, just to add to Vaughan's uh, uh, piece there already, um, there is an element of decommissioning cost for us if we were to dispose of an appliance um, through non-gifting um, uh, to the Gambia. So there are uh, members that need to be aware of decommissioning costs. There's also uh, the National Fire Chief Councils have given us guidance on disposal of fire appliances because of the security risk as well. So we've got to take into consideration as a service that both as commissioning costs but also as security element of a, a, a vehicle with blue lights on albeit that they can be removed, but they can be added post-out. Um, <coughs> security that could be let through an inner court and not be actually a, 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 a legitimate appliance attending that single incident. Yes, we shouldn't under-sell the Proposal. Yeah. I'll second that. Okay. 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 
Friend of Matthew and three days to be dedicated to the I have to say, I, I've gone and seen them in the, in the wild, if you like. Uh, my wife and I went to, on holiday, um, it wasn't on the fire authority, but my crew was, and he said, oh, you've got to go and see the fire brigade, so I've got a chauffeur by the like chief fire officer, and uh, show me things. It was actually amazing to watch what they did. They stitched their own uniforms, by the way. I, I recommended some of the things they do to the chief. It's not too big. <laughs> um, they all have gardens in there. Um, the, I mean, it's a social enterprise as well. Um, I would suggest if people would like to go to the Gambia, there's millions of mosquitoes there in the Cleaguins. Um, and it, it was inspiring to see what they're doing. I totally support it. I believe that so we have the chair of the gaps of charities that very patient at the end of Well, the yeah, thank you. Thank you. Not, not chair, the chair, but the, the trustee. Trustee, trustee. 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 sorry. Um, <coughs> to be perfectly honest, what you've what you've said is covered um, is covered it in, in quite some depth. We have got a video that we will show you. Um, and a picture paints a thousand words, so if you have a look at this, um, apologies to those of you who've seen it before. Um, you might be able to see the spelling mistake this time. Okay. Is there a prize? Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, uh, also, I'd like to just say on a separate note, thanks to the members who came to Yates on behalf of the crews. So the crews who were there last uh, couple of weeks back were really happy to put names to places. Um, so they were really happy to see them. Um, there is also a fire brigade <coughs> outside here. Uh, we will be around for half an hour or so afterwards, and you can have a look around the fire engine and have a look at the vehicle wrapping as well. <coughs> um, Amber, is there any way you can get this video to work? Um, <laughs> we just as a separate point as well, we've just recently been contacted by Gloucester and uh, Cumbria and they're looking at the disposal of assets as well and they're looking at this as a bit of a role model potentially um, as how they're going to move forward in the future so it's um, it's looking quite positive um, any love? Yes. yes thanks uh, chair I mean I'm very supportive in principle just to the absolute belt and braces, can we be sure that there has been no adverse comments by either the auditors or the Fire Chiefs National Council or any other national body? I'm just aware of anything. I think from the National Fire Chief Council point of view, we're very supportive. Uh, the, the, this charity links into Fire Aid. Um, and, and so there's a there's a, a number of services providing similar um, equipment and training to numerous countries around the world where they have got the same standard that we've got in this country. So that's very much supported by the National Fire Chiefs Council, who is adopting um, fire aid and the that we do uh, work with and in consultation with fire aid. And what have audit, the auditors said when this is obviously a big event? And again, I think that that's um, um, from from a from a visit point of view, a donation of equipment point of view, it's a cost neutral, self funded purpose. So, if colleagues in the room who I have been to the Gambia have done excellent work in training and and uh, uh, adopting those bits of equipment in country, that's all been self funded by them as individuals. Thank you.
Um, yeah, so thanks very much for your uh, time to watch this. If you do have any questions um, that you think about in the future, just feel free to contact any one of us. Emma, I think if you've got anything that you'd like to put in writing, any emails or anything, um, <coughs> if you email Emma Bowen, um, and then whatever your question is, we'll get back to you. Okay. Do you, do you have any other questions that come to mind at the minute? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, good film. Exactly what you do. I think what I really like about the gap is that we can see directly what we're doing. So we can see there are pretty much you can see our appliances, can't we? In fact, they're doing good. They're doing. I think that for me, that's 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 the massive plus. We are actually as an authority doing something which you can directly see the benefits whether people are less fortunate in the world than ourselves. Uh, we've had a, a nomination and a second in of the, of the two of recommendations. Are we happy to support those? Uh -huh. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues from GAPSIS, for your trouble on your presentation. Please keep up the good work. Thank you very thank much. You. We'll see you afterwards. And on to the first thing, which is the service delivery of the introduction. Can you do that, Lord? Sure. Thank you, sure. um, Members, this, is, this paper is just for noting, um, but it, it's also um, for new members of the fire authority, just uh, an introduction to the work of the um, risk reduction department. This is a growing priority <coughs> area for us, obviously prevention is better than cure, um, and aiding fire is not usually the work in preventing uh, fires, accidents and other emergencies from occurring in this department. I think it means the 21 fire stations are the outward facing delivery arm of this. Two key pieces of legislation. Uh, the Fire and Rescue Services Act um, provi uh, provides us with the legal system <coughs> to provide that advice to the public and education to the communities to limit harm and make sure that emergencies don't happen in the first place. And the Regulatory Reform Order, Fire Safety Order of 2005 is the legislation of uh, uh, business uh, property safety, so looking at the infrastructure of buildings, making sure that they comply um, to fire safety standards. Um, within the risk reduction department and within the, delivery, uh, the, the service delivery strategy for the next um, three, three years, there are four key things within the risk reduction strategy. Um, we've got uh, children, young people, engaging with young people, making sure that, that we um, do uh, elements of safeguarding, but there's the education and awareness of, of potentially coming to harm, whether that's through fire harm or accident harm. Uh, vulnerable adults uh, in the community and working with vulnerable adults in communities to make sure that they're as robust and as resilient as possible to, to any harm. Uh, technical fire safety, as I mentioned, under the regulatory reform order, and then partnerships and collaboration. So just very briefly, um, just going through those, those four key areas. Children and young people, uh, the aim is to, is to enable every child and young person to thrive, develop skills, lead a healthy life and achieve their full potential. I think that sums up the work that that department does linking with firefighters on the 21 fire stations. We work through the key stages of, of education, and engaging the key stage one through to key stage four, and beyond the use of student life, um, and the role of the department is working with other agencies, both from a referral point of view and a safeguarding element, uh, but also engaging with those young people and making sure that, uh, uh, that we make them as resilient as possible when it comes to awareness of potential harm. Um, and a good example of that would be the work that's been done over in Bath and Bristol with the young people that we've unfortunately lost through um, the river accidents that we've had over there. There were nine students lost in, uh, in, in over just a few years in Bath um, due to, uh, due to uh, occurrences of uh, enjoying a good night out but unfortunately not, uh, not coming home. So both the service, um, the department, linking with other agencies, linking with local authority, linking with charity, charitable organisations, as an example, doing a, a huge amount of work in, in engaging with student, um, student life, the universities, uh, and doing active patrolling of the, of the waterways and, and the riverbanks, making sure that no harm comes to those students whilst they enjoy their student life with us in the community. Um, within the vulnerable adult arena, uh, the aim is for vulnerable adults to live a long, healthy lives by improving their safety, health, and well-being. And again, that's um, we've historically dealt with fire safety um, in, uh, as the key statutory requirement. 
We are now broadening that and working in what we call safe and well environment and moving into areas where every contact counts. It's a coined phrase that as soon as we make contact with that community, either by providing a home fire safety visit and fitting a smoke detector or an operational response intervention, that every contact counts. We are a very trusted agency, a very trusted brand in the community. With that trust comes responsibility, but it means we can actually provide not only fire safety, um, advice, accident safety advice, but also health and well-being advice. Um, we're not experts in that in rural environment, but we are doing linking in partnership with clinical commissioning groups, health and well-being boards, um, and we can safeguard and we can refer through that mechanism. Technical fire safety uh, under the fire safety order. Um, this is our building regulations in the business community. Um, uh, we, we've um, We've got inspecting officers that do a number of legal requirements, certainly building regulation applications and licensing, uh, but also audits, visits to, to properties and making sure that the uh, compliance with the order is there for the responsible person of that property or that building. Uh, we're also a primary authority scheme uh, uh, owner, which means that we provide fire safety advice not only for buildings, uh, well, it's buildings, uh, pan UK, um, in, uh, in the sense that we um, we provided uh, that, that statutory responsibility, making sure the statutory responsibility for those agencies are there for our housing uh, provider and the national student accommodation provider. And that's not just in Maine, that's across the whole of the country. And we're what we call the primary authority scheme for, for that uh, piece of work. Uh, we do prosecute under that legislation. Um, we've had a 100% success rate in prosecutions. It's not something we do. Um, uh, that we want to do, we, we have a, a phrase of um, coach for compliance. So we go into properties, the business community, and we want to coach and work with them to compliance. Sometimes that coach for compliance doesn't work. Unfortunately, um, some of those responsible people don't take heed of what they're trying to do and, and assist with them, and then we have to then take them down a, a, a prosecution route. Uh, we've got eight new technical fire safety officers joining us on the 1st of July, um, uh, um, which is uh, warmly welcome, and that's up in our uh, technical fire safety team, so 20 inspecting officers. Uh, and then just to finish with the partnerships, um, we have over 50 um, uh, formal partnerships um, and, and collaboration, and this again is working with other agencies, seeing the mutual benefit of collaboration and, and good collaboration values where linking with other agencies, certainly when it comes to potential harm in the community, that sharing of information, that joint education, that joint awareness um, programs, uh, and, and a good example of some of those uh, pieces of work that we've done. Um, Western Power, we've got a very good working relationship and collaboration partnership with Western Power. Um, they share data with us, and certainly they're vulnerable, um, they're vulnerable community data, which means that, um, um, which is all um, secured, securely shared under GDPR, but it means that we can actually actively engage with that community that are potentially vulnerable um, to provide home fire safety visits and other uh, education matters of course there, Chair. Uh, Neil hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, lots of good work, as always. I hadn't realised until the our fire station manager mentioned it to me last month that there is an issue over providing a permanent mooring on the haven, and uh, apparently some other authorities do have this facility. And um, I did take, I have spoken to a council officer about that, but it is a bit of a source of concern. Uh, is this matter being satisfactorily dealt with, do you think, or is there any more effort needed to put into this? Yes, guys, we're, we're, um, what we're intending to do, we, we, uh, we're hoping to house our rescue boat on the River Avon at Bath near Ferry Lane. Um, we're working with the local authority and with the Environment Agency um, to provide that facility for us, but we're still doing some ongoing work. I've linked it with the, the, the leader of uh, Baines um, to provide some support for that, and we're linking in with both the Emergency Planning Department, Defence Council. Um, uh, uh, to, to provide uh, that quicker response. So if you have a if you have a boat on the water, we've got a similar boat on the water in the in the dock side in Bristol, and it means that we actually then respond to the scene where the boat is moored, but it is literally then straight onto the boat and then straight to the scene of the rescue. So we're we're, we're work, still working with the council on that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, perhaps if you could keep me in the loop because it's part of my new duties as joint cabinet member for transport services, so that's going to be probably coming in me. A brief question, Rob. Um, I can imagine what you probably mean, but what is the exact definition of the use of vulnerable adults? Um, it, it, it's a, it's a, it can be a myriad of things. Um, what we find is the, um, the complexity of vulnerability. Um, what we have found is that a number of uh, agencies will be working with potential vulnerable people. When it comes to a fire safety element, those vulnerable people, you could, see the, you could say the, the very end of that vulnerable um, uh, uh, pathway of harm is when we're actually rescuing someone in a house fire. What we have done, and the British Fire Service have done this as well, is look back at, the, at why, how vulnerable was that person, and what was the, what was the, the journey of vulnerability. And what we have found is that um, individuals that have maybe have health vulnerability, or social deprivation, or um, uh, uh, um, uh, mental health issues, mental health vulnerabilities, they're already in contact with a number of agencies. So our role is to, is to try and encompass that and say that the, the end of that vulnerability chain could be that we're actually rescuing that individual from the fire, or even worse, they become a fatality in the fire. So the demographics of vulnerability for an adult can be a number of things. It can be age, it can be mental health related issues and dementia, uh, um, um, uh, dementia, thank you, dementia issues. Um, it can be um, social deprivation, it could be geography, it could be mobility and health issues, and all that goes in. We've got a now a new risk analytical piece of software, yeah. um, and what we do is we feed some of that data in, we, data we have and data from other agencies to provide that um, grading for vulnerability. So I imagine from that the bulk data comes from what social services and the NHS. I'm working with the commission groups, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've stopped data. I've stopped data out as a long time. <coughs> the aim here is well, quite quite identified is to get as far upstream as you can to stop that problem happening in downstream. And to stop us responding, essentially. So could I just ask a question on that then, which is probably more technical than me. So, so if somebody's identified with a new care package as example, so a bundle of blood or whatever what the science. Is there a direct engagement from the authority of that individual to go and do an assessment of their, their needs in terms of the, if there was to be a requirement? I understand you'd have the data, so therefore, if there was a call to that property, you may well be aware of their disability issues or whatever. But, but is, is the prevention at this stage now where you go and you need those individuals? It's saying if they have to try to choose more risk carefully capacity, but I don't mean it quite like that, to understand, you know, you, you are having mobility issues, therefore it's sensible for you to keep the, you know, you can't basically take and get out. Well, Do you well, engage to that level? No. Yeah, I've well, spoke about partnerships and we have a number of partnerships that are set up, and within those partnerships you have referral pathways, so we'll be referred by certain partners, mainly through local authorities and, and um, and carers groups to, to say this individual is vulnerable and then we will intervene. So we yeah. will then go and do a home safety visit and we'll do what we need to do in order to make that individual safe from harm and the potential that incident happening reduces. Can I have a question? Just one more question. When you referred to children and young people, you said at the key stage forward. So did we not, we, so did the authority not engage with teenage children then? Because key stage four is. <coughs> you get to five and six anyway when you secondary school. Yes, yeah, so we, we um, from the key stage one point of view is about um, fire safety education, but in a, in a friendly environment, yeah. because obviously young we don't want to fight yeah. young people. Yeah, yeah. Right way through is the key stage four bit. One of the bits of key stage four for us is we know we've got young adults potentially going into um, university. into university <coughs> and to drive it. So some of the key messages we're doing in the education we're doing there is um, more lifestyle. lifestyle and driving <coughs> self-awareness. So they already have a, 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 an awareness of when they start to learn the fantastic freedom of driving, it comes with some risk. 
but we also then engage at the university and student level as well. So they don't matter what you start in their independent um, studies, we do a, a lot of work around fire safety, water safety, personal safety, linking with police, they, they provide that, but we link in with them. Sit around freshers week. <laughs> including fire alarm testing, as I witnessed in Bristol last year, which was most entertaining. <coughs> and then another example, just a quick bit, uh, if I may check, it's another example where, where we're doing a lot of work with suicide prevention schemes in Bristol and Bath for young students, <coughs> young students and we've seen some, um, unfortunately, seen um, some students take that route, which is very sad. Um, again, we're doing some work with suicide prevention schemes and working with, we're not the experts, but we, we provide a mechanism of trusted ground yes. with those students. Any further questions, comments? Thank you for your input. Okay, so we're happy to note that report. Yes. Oh, yeah. We want to write some fourteen, which is the five year old community, which we tend to summarise this this I am checking um, uh, very briefly. Um, members, there are nine incidents in your papers. Just gives that, that isn't just the nine incidents we've had since the report at the time. That just gives a flavour of the very holistic response that we have in, in the pharmacy service. I'd like to just concentrate on um, uh, the incident of 3.15, which is the uh, years on the third of May at Foundry Lane. I've got a presentation that shows a few photographs, because I think you get a picture of a thousand words. I think certainly members from Bristol and South Gloss would have been talking in vain, but we need to be aware of, of, of this particularly nasty incident that's drawn Henshaw um, former premises. And it's a, a good way of showing the level of commitment of our, of our crews to keep people safe. I think the Bristol members can remind me that quite a few people were evacuated in their homes for a prolonged period, weren't they, as a result of this incident? So, uh, members may be aware we've had two incidents at this site. We had one on New Year's Eve, uh, which was an accidental fire, confined to a, uh, one room, uh, and put out reasonably quickly, um, although there were some complications in fighting that fire, because it was a basement, and they, they become quite difficult. This one on the 3rd of May, um, unknown ignition, but this one was actually the whole building involved in fire. Um, some of the details of the fire so itself, uh, 1822 on the 3rd of May was the first call into service control. There were a number of calls because obviously the smoke and the flames were seen Bristol wide as the incident progressed. The first appliances are seen were Kingswood and Temple. Uh, the fire was in a uh, floor, uh, uh, floor paint spraying uh, booth, but mixed commercial area as well. Um, paint spraying is not particularly good when it comes with fire because the very flammable materials and the flammable um, spray materials um, accelerate that fire so more. Early on, we made pumps six and made pumps ten. Now, as far as it was too large, it's actually requested more fire appliances. So we requested very early on, apart from the two that were initially in attendance, we requested requested another four, making up the six, and then another four, which making up the ten. So ten fire appliances, traditional fire appliances in attendance. Aerial ladder platforms for us in in England, that's turntable ladders. We have four of them: Bath, Bristol, Western Supermare, and Bedminster fire stations. We had one turntable ladder um, not on that night; it was in on, on for a service. Um, but we uh, requested four aerial appliances. The fourth one, the three turntable ladders were there. The fourth one came from Gloucestershire Fire Rescue Service with their hydraulic platform, which is our new <coughs> um, normal 13, 16 arrangements, which is mutual, uh, mutual aid. Major incident was declared. Um, major incident was declared about 21, about 9 o'clock in the evening. That was to do with one of the, the, uh, the size of the incident, but also the fact that um, there were 16 settling cylinders in the fire and they were exploding at the incident. Um, and also there was a no, uh, quite a uh, large quantity of asbestos that was picked up in the smoke plume and being projected over parts of Bristol. So in consultation with the emergency management team at Bristol City Council, we declared fire, declared a major incident. 
and then tactical coordinating group that coined the silver that was um, set up the tactical element of it away from the scene um, down at Victoria Street um, uh, in Bristol City Council um, led by Bristol, Bristol City Council fire service and multi-agency coordinating group remote from the scene just to show some of the photographs um, the building is set to rise so normally the, front of the, building, the main access to the building for us is what we call sector one if you then move in a clockwise direction, you have sector two on the side, sector three at the back, and sector four on the other side. This picture shows parts of sector four and sector three. Um, I took over the incident as the incident commander at 15 minutes past nine. Um, literally within about five or six minutes, I took over. The whole building was involved in, in fire, and then set incidents were exploding as we were uh, as we were trying to deal with the incident itself. You can see the, the amount of involvement of fire was, was huge. That's sector one, so that's the sort of front of the building. And again, if you think of a building, the Strong and Henshaw building being probably 300 metre arm that way, 300 metre arm that way, and a high rise in the middle. And then sector one, you can see the turntable ladders in use, uh, effectively putting that fire out. Um, and sector four, we had another turntable ladder and a hydraulic platform and hand jets into that building uh, again. My three priorities as the incident commander were safety on the scene for all, all responders, fire, police and ambulance and local authority. We maintain that extremely well with the crew an <coughs> exemplary job. Limit the spread of fire. Uh, the next photograph shows thermal imaging from the drone, the police drone, um, and that was showing hot spots occurring on neighbouring businesses and neighbouring residential properties. Um, that was one of my key aims was to stop that fire from spreading to other businesses. And, and other neighbouring communities and, and, and property itself. And then the third um, was liter literally to have a tactical firefighting plan using the four aerial appliances to start putting that fire out and moving it into the middle to then extinguish that fire, which we did later on that night. Just to finish with, that's the, uh, that's the drone footage from the police drone that we asked to come. That was an extremely useful tool because it gave me an overall uh, thermal picture not only of where the fire was travelling through the building but just as importantly those hot spots on neighbouring businesses were starting to occur and I could actually get a direct tactical firefighting to stop that spread of fire. I'll pause there, Chair. Thank you, Rob. Also, uh, uh, within your paper, um, the Fluid London Trust, we had uh, contact through the Fluid London Trust for colleagues, uh, for members in the room that, um, that the Fluid was a firefighter with us, um, who tragically died um, at the Atlington Leos in Staple Hill. Um, Great Western Railways uh, approached us uh, last year to say we were to name a train under her honour. Um, we, um, we link in through the Fleur Lombard bursary. Um, when Fleur tragically died, uh, there was a, 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 a bursary set up by donation of money throughout the country. That money, uh, Roger and Jane, um, Jane uh, Fleur's mum and dad, set the bursary up to allow other firefighters, specifically junior officers and other firefighters, to travel the world to learn um, firefighting and fire rescue te techniques through the bursary mechanism. Um, with GWR um, naming the train, um, both Roger and Jane, uh, mum and dad of Fleur, uh, uh, were thrilled that the, the name of firefighter Fleur Lombard was, was to live on. Um, and we had a, a, a naming ceremony on the 14th of May uh, at Bristol Temple Meads where the service, the family, the Fleur's family were present. Um, and the UK Fire Service was, was present to actually do the official uh, naming of the train for firefighters through the Lombard. Thank you, Marcus. I do the train marks at that ceremony. I think it was uh, an honour to, to be asked. I think it was an honour for the Fleur and Company to be so recognised. Absolutely. Any questions, comments? Ruth? Um, what I wanted to say was on the 
through row T, where Lincoln Housing is, Boston Creek, and there. It's in the ward next to me. What's that the children's? Um, that got hit by lightning. Yeah. Yes. Well, they thought it was my ward, which it wasn't. And I went out and had a look at it. And I must say that everybody who was there, I have to say this, were fantastic. Because the building was hit by lightning on the, mm. on the roof. Mm. And if you stood on the other side, obviously you couldn't get near it, and you saw what the teams were doing, it was just amazing mm. to see it. You know, we all sort of back and said, good grief, you know. It wasn't my ward, but even so, just to say who it was, I went to that book. And it was absolutely fantastic, so I think it was wonderful. Just, just for a matter of interest, <coughs> I, as the chair, get informed of a major incident. I always ask, is there a ward member? Is it, there, is it a member's ward or near a member's ward? So hopefully members will get a telephone call from the from the from Rob and the team to say that obviously you do maybe get the maybe getting questions asked of you as a not only a council but also as a fire department. Yes, they also there was another incident. Um, it was a bomb. Well they thought it was a bomb. I yeah. don't know if there's a difference between a bomb and an incendiary device. I don't know. But again, they thought it was my ward because of the border. And I went out to that as well. And I spoke to the police. There were fire people, mm -hmm. fire officers there. But they didn't seem to be involved because they stopped it. They didn't go off. But I spoke to everybody there. And they all said, you know, if there was anything, yeah. then the police would step back and the fire officers would come in. And again, you know, you, mm -hmm. what do we know? We just, yeah. you know, this is terrific. Yeah, thank you. Chairman raises a good point, members, uh, that if there is a significant incident on your ward or in your ward or in your general area, you, you may well get a phone call from an officer um, to update you, to provide you a briefing in terms of that incident. Um, and certainly we'll brief the chair regularly in terms of incidents that are going on within It's just that we can convey it to the mm -hmm. residents of course. so that they know that everybody's safe. And, and you may get contacted by the press and, and the residents, so yeah, absolutely you need to be informed. So and in rural areas, there. it's even more yeah. difficult. Yeah. 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 We should take it. Uh, thank you, John. Yes, like, like Ruth, uh, my ward is just to the west of um, where this um, incident took place, so also in the 3.19, I just wonder if you could perhaps give us a bit more detail, obviously not to the depth you, you, you just presented, but uh, if you, it's a bit more that you can maybe add to what's in the report. Maybe. I've got that, got that here. Um, so uh, so the, the, the incident was at uh, 1843, um, and we tipped out, uh, we mobilised uh, one appliance from Western Super Mayor, who, um, and uh, the, the, the sort of stop message, the message that comes back is that the, the work that we've done, um, uh, was, I'm just making sure I've got the right incident here, yes I have, uh, from Watch Manager to Flatwood, the following uh, several light instructing area, uh, BT Central so Stand property checked using um, thermal imaging camera and advice given. So the, um, the crews uh, used the turntable ladder, it's a commercial property struck by lighting, lightning, um, structural damage, uh, Firefox found six adults and two children were evacuated from the property. Our, our key role in that is one, is there any fire risk? Because obviously with, with lightning there's a huge amount of electricity and energy that can cause fire. Um, but also there's structural damage. So is it to a point, not this incident, but I've had it before, where the structural damage is actually <coughs> invoked our urban search and rescue team being mobilised. So you've got a firefighting team there dealing with something similar to the fire. Um, but also you've got then structural <coughs> damage and if you've got people trapped in that building you want them to do search and rescue or that's part of urban search and rescue but likewise to make the building as safe as possible so that their building control structural engineers can go and decide on what they want to do with that property itself um, so uh, and I think that stop message was conveyed at uh, reasonably quickly 1855 Thank you very much Thank you, Thank you. Okay. Well, Thanks. So going back to the Lombard, I'm involved in railway here, this is some people might know. But was it an actual main plate that was attached, or was it painted? It was painted, I believe. It was painted. I think it's on one of the new Toshiba yeah. units going yeah. on the express train. No, I, but what, what, where I was going was that um, if it's an actual plate, then often they'll produce a third 
plate, but it doesn't look as if that's going to be possible. I don't think any of those, because the people, they've got a name each, each power car, I mean, I think you'll know more than I will. Yeah. They're all painted on now rather than making yeah, yeah, plates. Yeah, 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 no. Okay, no, well, don't worry. It'd be nice to have had a, you know, representation, maybe, in here or whatever. So, um, I might still ask a question about that. But presumably she's the first, is she the first female firefighter who's done it in the time, yeah. In the okay. Okay, so are we happy to note that report? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. in order to discharge the 62 recommendations of the improvement plan uh, post the statutory inspection in 2017. Um, it might be just useful um, to recap on the history um, of the last kind of uh, work that we've done over the last uh, two years, particularly for, for new members. Um, members formerly um, on the Fire Authority and, and new members joining us today uh, will recall um, that the Fire Authority in July 2017 uh, approved 62 recommendations um, as part of our overall um, improvement journey and the improvement team has been working steadily over the last um, 18 to 20 months um, to sign those off um, as complete. And in order to do that, um, we establish a robust um, scrutiny architecture for member-led scrutiny of our evidence um, that has been presented to members. They have looked at that evidence and decided whether or not they are satisfied that the evidence adds up to a position such that they can sign off the recommendations as complete. That then feeds the rest of the external improvement architecture which the, the Chief established which goes through internal improvement board and external improvement board along with a couple of um, task specific improvement boards all the way through to the National Fire Chiefs Council um, and the, the, fire, the Police and the Fire Minister at the Home Office. So it's a, a whole package of, of scrutiny which ensures that um, we are making good and um, and uh, scrutinised progress along our improvement journey. And the paper today um, looks for the authority's approval to sign off four of those 62 recommendations um, as complete. We made no apology for ensuring that our scrutiny arrangements are um, very robust. We had um, a mid programme review by the local government associations part of their peer support um, review network early on uh, this year. And indeed, they actually came out and said that we, they thought perhaps we had um, overcompensated in terms of scrutiny, but for that we made no apology because it was vitally important that in progressing the improvement journey, we were living out the seven principles of public life and indeed our own service values. So we were very happy that the progress along the improvement journey has been subject to that um, significant scrutiny. So in order to sign off or, or uh, present these recommendations uh, for approval for, um, from the authority, they have been presented to our improvement working group, which is the first stage of member-led scrutiny. Um, normally, they would then have gone to the performance review and scrutiny committee um, for secondary scrutiny, although on this particular occasion, because of the calendar of events and PERDA, there was no intermediate <coughs> PRSC uh, meeting, so therefore they've gone straight from the Improvement Working Group um, straight to the authority for 
um, hopefully, approval. The full recommendations are laid out in the report. The detailed scrutiny of the evidence, which adds up to us presenting those to be considered as complete, is also listed. And that's available on our electronic document repository base camp, which members of the previous fire authority will be aware of, and indeed new members should already have their details about <coughs> how to use base camp and how it's used in our improvement journey. The purpose today is not to go through, um, again, that detailed screening of the evidence, but it is there before you, um, and the four recommendations are presented for approval. So I think we're on that. Reasons why fire authorities hold reserves. 
Um, these are the essential tools to ensure that long-term long budget stability is maintained, and particularly in the current financial climate where far we are facing significant savings over the medium term, and also uncertainty around a number of issues, including Brexit, including the um, comprehensive spending review and fair funding, which are a number of issues that we really don't know what the outcomes of those will obviously be um, in the future. So research can be held to mitigate the impact of those going forward. Um, I would like to also point out that there, there is no statutory minimum or maximum level of reserves that a foreign authority are, are required to hold. It is purely uh, a discretion for these farms and the future to determine what those levels are. Um, the recommendations are set out on page 91, um, and that is for the members to um, agree the reserve strategy uh, for the next uh, four years and to agree this being published on the website. Paul? Oh. It's a small point, but it's a new member. I think I think it's all about people. I sort of started reading it as if it was reserved. And that's a small point. In the first sentence somewhere, if I hadn't been, not now, but long term, it just put the word financial early on. Sorry, yeah. Because yeah. and you call it reserves. And yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's actually reserve which I see in statutory. Mm -hmm. that you have to call it a reserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. But the, the main point is in the comparison with other authorities, <coughs> unless I've missed it, it is very tiny. <coughs> Explain to me, well, have they got bigger commitments? Because is it a question of a value of reserves? Because if, if you've got reserves of one organisation with a massive turnover and commitment, and then another, it, surely it's relative to the scale of your operation part of the reserves. And I, I don't get that from that diagram. So it, it could be misleading. Or well, has every single fire authority got all the same commitment? And that's it. So we we have got a problem because we are going around. It's, 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 it's my delusion that there's, there's no statutory requirement to hold them, to hold any reserves at all. There are, there are some bills of prudence in which the section one one two of the new condition that Martin has set to guide us as far as the continuing nature of reserves. And I think that our effectively our earmarked reserves are as per state, and there's a one point five million. A general reserve, which you have, we have a percentage of our turnover, is it? Is that what you're going to So, Chris, if I can tell you, I'd like to see the percentage of the reserve to turnover, because oh, otherwise it's, it's yeah. a meaningless grant, yeah. yeah. because yeah. if they're ten times the size of us, I don't know, then obviously we may have quite a large reserve yes. in proportion to what our commitments are, and that's what reserves are about, in all this, yeah. not as a minimum. Can we get that money? Oh, we've only had four hours of work. Uh, no, that's not a problem. We can circulate that. I mean, obviously, this was just an extract from the HMICFRS. We, we haven't produced that. We certainly can, but it's a very good point that you made. Obviously, reserves are, are need to be compared to the turnover of yeah. farm rescue services. And even are one of the smaller farm rescue services in the country. Yes. And it's a fair point that you made. Um, going back to the, the point that the, the chief made, the chair, sorry. The only statutory requirement is that the, um, all, all authorities, including local authorities, are required to hold a general reserve, which is, is what the chair alluded to. Um, yes, the 1.5 million is what the power authority has deemed to be a reasonable amount um, compared with, with the size of our budget. Um, those, those amounts are shown in the in the larger green area on, on that graph, but of course that is the only um, the only such reserve bit we are yeah. required to hold for us. The far to be determined the level of that um, general reserve. Um, we we say one point five million, which is about three point five three point five percent of our budget. Well, I think you make a very valid point, Paul, and we'll get that addressed and the information back. Um, I, don't, I don't want to create um, it it is, it's it's not a problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, Richard Tucker. Thank you. Uh, Martin mentioned um, we could possibly be on the Western Fire Station. And, um, is that likely to be on the same site then, or is it, are we looking at other sites? I know the, the police have just moved out of the town centre in the Tour of World, and that's kind of a development area. The, the current fire station in one ward, so I just wanted to put here more about long term thinking. And, I think the 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sir. Um, the, that question will be addressed in um, the, the next item, which is uh, a member's update with regards to uh, the old certain states. So uh, we'll, we'll be included later on. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Obviously, this paper is looking <coughs> current and future reserves. Um, as a relative new boy, could someone with a longer memory than me just say, has historically, has even far authority had equally modest reserves? Um, I can try to answer that question. So obviously, when <laughs> um, Aidan Farnes was sort of this first created, unfortunately, um, no reserves were transferred from Aidan County Council. So all of those reserves have been built up since 1996. Um, the reserves were shared out uh, between the Yorkshire authorities and, and the environment research, although it, it, it may request to have some of those <coughs> uh, was successful. So those reserves have been built up over the years. Um, it is prudent to all these reserves, because um, future funding from the government is, 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 is uncertain. We, we know that, well, we don't know, I don't know whether Brexit is happening or not happening, but we know there will be implications from, from Brexit. Um, so we do need to, to add some cushion to be able to allow us to meet um, new financial pressures as they make it the wrong one. Okay. Are any questions, comments, queries? Okay, so are we happy to approve the two recommendations? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. We want to open 17. We do the chair again, Mike. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. First <coughs> answer. Yeah, the uh, financial action report for the last financial year was presented to the Audit Government and Ethics Committee on the 31st of May 2019, <coughs> and it did reference some budget variations which, in order to comply with financial regulations, <coughs> need to be reported to the Fire Authority. Uh, these budget variations would ordinarily have been considered by the General Purposes Committee, which was scheduled to take place on the 11th of April 2019, but um, this meeting was cancelled, so um, members have not had the opportunity to consider and approve the, these um, budget variations. Um, they are shown in Appendix 1 to the report. Um, obviously, uh, it has been necessary to use the statement of accounts and everything else. Um, Assuming that members will agree and, and approve these variations, but they are they are attached as appendix one to members' information and, and to endorse them. Um, I don't think there's much more to add. That is it's really to comply with the requirement for members to be uh, made aware of, of, of budget variations that occur. Okay, and they were reviewed at the audit committee on the 31st of May. They were reviewed at the audit committee, but uh, the audit business and ethics committee. I didn't think technically have the power yeah. to agree that, so that's why it's necessary to bring it back to the members. Yeah. Do we have any, any queries, comments, questions? Are we happy then to approve the recommendation of noting and endorsing the budget adjustments? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we move on to the next item, which is the, the next meeting. The next meeting is the next formal meeting of the file of the 25th of September. Before that, there will be two more uh, training training days for members, one of which is the 12th of July when we look at the Constitution, and we meet on the 4th of September, and we have a further update to members and to education <coughs> training to, to get us up to, up to speed with a variety of topics as specified in, in the list. So, what, why do we have these training days? Well, the Christmas is made of the fire authority and the lack of knowledge whether they take our, our work properly. So we, 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 are, we are majoring on people a lot of new members and working to make sure they're up to speed in all, all areas of the fire authority we can properly challenge the service and <coughs> task to do so by the residents of Aden and by and by central government as well. So thank you for that. We've gone to item 18, which is <coughs> the press and the public. 